Paddy Power, sponsors of The Road to Cheltenham. Hello everyone, welcome to Road to Aintree, the logical follow-on from our weekly Road to Cheltenham series. In this show, as ever, annually, we focus primarily on the Randox Grand National, but there will also be time to look at Aintree's rather compelling-looking Grade 1s. And to do that with me, I'm delighted to say, here in the studio is Jane Mangan. Jane, welcome. Do I have to do this? You know, the way you and Ruby do that. <laughs> that is obligatory. We will be requiring you to do that later on, before you leave. <laughs> It's great to be here. <laughs> Good. At any time you feel like doing that during the show as well, just feel free. When Ruby Relax. says something I don't agree with. <laughs> I will be watching for that. <laughs> Let's introduce Ruby, who joins us by the power of video link. Ruby, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm great, Lydia. Yourself? How are you, Jen? I'm very well. Um, I'm looking forward to this week, but I'd say not as much as you. Yeah, it's a great week. Well, hopefully it'll be a good week. But hey, look, we have a packed show, Jim. We haven't time for chit-chat in this one, so we better get cracking. <laughs> so rude. He's so brusque. It's, it's as if I don't know what he's like. <laughs> chit-chat. When do we ever have chit-chat? We never have chit-chat. Certainly not here. Right, let's get on with it, Ruby. Let's start by addressing what will be new about the Grand National for 2024. Those changes came about following the admittedly ugly scenes and chaotic edition of the race last April, which began with animal rising protesters infiltrating the race course following a review of the race carried out by Aintree's operators and owners, Jockey Club Racecourses and the BHA Racing's Gathering Authority here in Britain. These are the key changes. They can be summarised under reducing the risk of incidents during the race, hence the reduced field size, and that has been brought about by independent research papers, uh, reducing the opportunity for horses to build up too much speed, hence the fact that the start has moved 60 yards closer to the first fence, creating the possible pre-race environment, that includes the ground, investing in changes to the infrastructure of the course, and also ensuring that the horses participating are in the best conditions to do so, hence the pre-race veterinary protocols continue. They're in place for all races at Aintree, but also at Cheltenham. They've got a minimum rating of 130. 30 now, which brings the Grand National into line with Grade 1 races, and also the Grand National Review Panel, who already existed, but they've been given extra powers. They can scrutinise horses entered in the race that have made jumping errors in 50% or more of their last eight races. Jane, first of all, what do you make of the changes before we hear from Ruby, what he thinks the impact on the race will be? Look, I know a lot of thought went into the reducing the field size uh, I'm, I've mixed feelings about it. Obviously, you're going to reduce risk, but sure, if you if you start etching away, when when does we when do we get to the end of the line? Um, a standing start again, it's not going to suit every horse, um, and the occasion can get to them. So, look, I hope we don't have any drama, and I hope somebody's dreams aren't quashed before the race even begins. Uh, the minimum handicap rating makes absolute sense. Uh, getting a little bit closer, 60 yards closer to the first fence makes sense. Uh, they reduce the height of uh, fence 11, the open ditch, uh, to from 5 foot to 4, 10. That's fine. Um, but yeah, look, the, the Grand National has been evolving over time. Some people describe it as erosion. I think I have described it as erosion. But I just hope we're here now. I hope it works. And I hope that we have done enough and that we don't need to keep chipping away. Yeah, I, I take your concern about the, the 34 field because that's kind of the character of the national, isn't it? What in many ways marks it out from other races. But I know that when they last had a look at the race and made some of those changes, like changing the solid cores and levelling out the landing side and reducing some of the, the fence sites back in 2012, after the 2012 running, they considered and rejected the field size and making it smaller. But loads of research to suggest a correlation between field sizes, number of incidents, it makes obvious But, like, sense. if you throw enough paint at a wall, how much of it's going to stick? Of course, that's just natural common sense. But, um, look, I think this is a five-year strategy by Aintree, and I think they're going to review it after five years. But I think once the number comes down, it's never going to go back up. No. It's hard, it's hard to imagine that it, that it would do. You, you I couldn't justify it, really, could you? I quite like the standing start, I have to say. I thought that a lot of the problems were, were caused by that. Obviously, it was exacerbated what, by, by what was going on beforehand and everyone feeling a bit enervated Should by it. Should we just thing. have stalls, then? <laughs> <laughs> Why are we having everybody line up in a row and then everybody's going to be fighting for the inside position? Because, you know, in traditional nationals, you could, I think last year's one, Coco Beach was the widest of all and he hit the front going to the first. But naturally, everybody's going to get a little bit closer to that railing. 
the faster you go, I, I would presume. OK, so that could potentially exacerbate bunching on the inside. Ruby, what do you think? Um, I think that, that there's different reasons for why the numbers had to come down. I would be pro a standing start. It was a standing start in the past. And I think when you look at last year's race, a standing start is required to reduce the speed that they get up to the first fence. And I think the whole nature of the race has changed the way people ride it since they've changed the course of the fences and uh, did away with their drops on the landing sides. But look, when you watch last year, they're galloping now. Bottom of your shot, there's the starter. So they were already galloping some 10 yards before they even got to the starter in last year's Grand National. And because of that, they built up a huge head of steam. Now, Jane is right, Coco Beach, right here, shot the grey horse. He powers down the outside under Harry Cobden. Now, beside him is Cloudy Glenn, who ends up on the floor and brings down Reciter Prayer. And to the left of your shot, two of the four horses that went to the first fence were going the fastest on the outside. That was built purely for momentum by being took up from a gallop and start. This is 2013, Balthazar King. Now look from Balthazar King to the white rail on the outside, how much space there is outside him. That was brought in because of the bypassing and the optical illusion that it creates. Whereas in 2005, look at the outside rail. Outside rail, the inside rail. The Grand National used the whole track. 40 runners in 2005 heading the beachers outside rail to not quite the inside because they didn't use the inside because of the drop but they're spread all across the track back to 2013 if you watch them approaching beachers they're congregated in the middle because riders quite hadn't quite figured out that the inside wasn't there was no risk attached to the inside anymore but when you go to 2023 watch last year's race 40 runners or however many, many were left standing were using the inside half of the track the whole nature of the race has changed Everybody goes to the inside, and when you're only using half of what's there, 40 was too many. And the standing start to me makes perfect sense. And the idea that some will balk, well, that's down to riders. And uh, you can't put a horse's head on the tape and expect them not to look at it. You have to stand back a, a fraction and anticipate when you want to move forward. But I think both a standing start and 34 runners, I can see why that happened, and I think and I hope they'll work. In a way, there's, I would have gone further. I think I'd have had a look at horses, not just with jumping issues. I think I'd have had a look at horses that had given trouble at the start previously. How about you, Ruby? You could have, but I would be just for leaving them there, Lydia. Um, and if the bookmakers can deal with whatever way they want to deal with that as regards an on-runner or not an on-runner, but if you don't line up, I would just leave you there. Um, and going back to Jane's Thierry and Stalls, it sounds great, but you'd have 20 minutes in the Grand National because that's about all there's wait for. It was tongue in cheek. I don't want to put a 17 2 chaser into a stall. <laughs> and the ro jockeys ride a bit longer and all this, but look, it, it just, in theory, somebody at home might be like, that's a little bit. It might be a Ted Watt comment. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's talk about Animal Rising, because obviously um, they were the ones that caused those protests last time. Um, Greg Wood wrote in The Guardian last Thursday, and he was quoted one of their primary spokespeople, and they claim to be suspending their direct action against horse racing. They won't be at the Grand National, they say. They say the public have in large part been convinced that they don't want racing to be part of the fabric of British culture going forward. A, Jane, do you believe them that they won't be there? And B, what do you make of their assertion? They can say it, but I won't believe it until I see it. I don't, you, know, you can't trust unlawful protests and what happened last year shouldn't have happened. Um, I think as a community and as broadcasters ourselves, we learned a lesson. I thought they got too much airtime um, for the behaviour that we saw. Um, and look, I've, I've read everything I've seen, Sky News during the week. Um, I hope the racing gets all the, the right headlines and I certainly won't be giving them any more airtime than they need. One good thing is that Horsepower, the website, has been launched and this is a joint project between the British Horse Racing Authority, Great British Racing and also the independently chaired Horse Welfare Board. It's racing's first communication platform focused entirely on equine welfare and they say they want to open the doors to the sport, Jane, to talk about the thoroughbred, their purpose, the lives they lead and the high welfare and safety standards that underlie British racing and to share the improvement work that is always ongoing it's been created to provide facts, help educate and to confront tough questions head on. What do you make of it? Yeah, I think it's a positive. I think the timing is absolutely right. Um, we always say when we're trying to convey our brilliant sport and our passion for it, that it's about educating, informing. And that's exactly what this, this information is. And this, it's an efficient site. I was on it this morning trying to navigate it. It's absolutely bulletproof. Um, 
I think I think when it was launched, it was a campaign. The word campaign was used. That's the wrong word because this isn't going to be we're throwing it out there for the month of April and we won't come back till this time next year. It needs to be consistent. And as an industry, we have nothing to hide. We're very proud of what we do. The welfare, protection, everything that is in place now, I think should be applauded. And that's what this site does. And if you are challenged as an industry person, no matter where you are, or who you are, if you're just a fan, that you should be able to recite some of these facts because this is our argument. And it shouldn't be an argument, it should be a conversation, but it's a conversation we find ourselves having more and more. If you've ever seen Constitution Hill work, you'd wonder why they didn't run him on the flats. He won't be running for a little while, but there's not many that can beat him. I've never seen, well, I haven't seen a horse that seven bars can get anywhere near him. So if they did decide to run him on the flat, I know Michael Buckley, he played with the idea a while back, but if they ever ran him on the flat, he would take some pegging. It's the hope that kills us. Yeah, yeah. It? It's the hope that kills us. So Jane and I are going to talk about the other talking point that has dominated this year's national and nationals in recent years, Jane, and that is the domination of Irish train runners. And those are the past four years, and increasingly there are far more Irish runners in the field than British trained ones. And as clear as day as those proportions are rising, it's clear as day as to the reason why. You asked Martin Greenwood, I asked the handicapper in Ireland, Sandy Shaw, in the UK, you have 1,998 horses with an official handicap rating, of which 75 have a rating of 145 or higher, so 4% margin. In Ireland, we have 714 chasers with a rating of which 101 have a rating of 145 or higher, which is a margin of 14%. So if ratios are to be believed, we should have at least three to your one, mm -hmm. which you can see there. We have the bulk of the highest rated chasers in Ireland. And that's the reason we're going to have the most runners. Yeah, it's pretty much as expected. It's going to pan out as those populations would suggest. I know that Ruby would say, why? But we don't have time for that. We need to focus on what's going to win the 2024 Grand National. Let's have a look, shall we, at the betting. And the title holder, Corrick Rambler, is five to one with Paddy Power. I Am Maximus is seven to one, the Irish Grand National winner from last season. Meeting of the Waters, the novice looking to emulate Noble Yates from two years ago is eight to one. And Vanillier, who is a surging runner up to Corrick Rambler, he is next in at nine to one. It is ten to one and upwards the rest. But Ruby, the logical place to start, given we have the winner and runner up among ten horses from last year reopposing, is what happened 12 months ago. Uh, here we are, last year's Grand National, Corey Bramble, middle of your shot, uh, had a good position early on, we skipped the start, we got to beach, there's Coco Beach, there's the nine horse, Vanillia towards the back, Noble Yates wide on the left, and Corey Bramble in head of the scrum in the middle. Now what was interesting when you watched last year's race, the perception of Vanillia came from so far back. But when you watch him here going to Fine Avon, he's actually not that far behind Corey Bramber or Vanillia. He loses his position much later than that. The first horse of note to disappear, well, we lost a couple early, but at this point it was Longhouse Port. He goes to the canal turn here under JJ Slevin, and yeah, it doesn't give him much chance of staying on. Up to Valentine's, the loose horses, well, they created their drama and they took out Lifetime Ambition. That was like an old fashioned Grand National watching that. And with him, they got to the 13th, Roy Maj and Corey Bramber were the two horses in the beautiful position where you wanted to be but the ones in front were going too fast no doubt about that neither of them even got to the finish line the chair we lost a couple towards the back we lost um sam brown and henry's horse starts to run the pertemps this year delta will concede the rider at the 21st key eventually getting rid of his jockey and at the canal turn mr incredible down the inside still traveling well his saddle slipped with brian hayes who eventually loses his battle with gravity and slips out the side door um but think up to the third last coca beach is paying the price he's dropping backwards and cory cramber is coming to the fore vanillia has gotten a bit further back than he wanted to be cory cramber or vanillia ain't that a shame who traveled well for a long time didn't stay capitano though he had the one run he ran out of fitness and nobody else eventually started to stay on when it was all too late Last fence, Carl Gamble's going to bolt in. Vanillia does run home, the grey horse, and Noble Yates, who finishes fourth. But look, he looked a runaway winner last year. He's pulled himself up from the elbow. He's gone up in the weights. He's had a good run in the Gold Cup. Can Vanillia turn it around with him? Not for, not for my money off he's running the Bobby Joe, but maybe he will. 
So if we take our race and IQ data and look back at last year's Grand National and the horses that took part, you can see that the average speed lost, Noble Eighth comes out on top. His second run at entry, he only lost 4.52 miles per hour on average per fence. And that goes all the way to the bottom. Now you can take out Galvin. Why did he unseat Debbie Russell? Because he lost eight and a half miles an hour when he hit the first fence and got rid of him. But the one that probably jumped slowest of all that got the furthest was Mr. Incredible 5.99 and maybe that mistake in the canal turned to start that but Corey Grammler 4.92 and Vanilla 5.3 so Vanilla probably jumps that needs to jump a bit quicker but that could be said of a few more in this race as Jane is going to point out in a while Absolutely uh, but first we need your help we've already asked for it uh, as you know your views and your understanding of racing are a key part of this show so we asked you via social media this question which horse do you think will win the 2024 Randolph's Grand National and why? And as ever, the and why is the most important part. And we'll be uh, scattering your views across the course of the next few minutes. Now, Ruby and Jane and I have picked out some horses to talk about for good and for bad. <laughs> uh, positive reasons and negative reasons, positive cases and negative cases. And we're going to start, Ruby, with last year's winner, Corak Rambler. Yeah, he's the obvious best to start, Liddy, isn't he? And here he is winning last year's race. He's come back this season and had a couple of runs. I wouldn't be too worried about his first start to Kelso. He was tailed off here, or dropping out of the race, going to the third last. But his first run last year was no different. He then went to Haydock, where he ran much, much better in the Betfair chase behind Ryan Pugai in Brave Man's Game. Protector at his behind him. But he got on their tails and kept going all the way to the line before lining up in the Gold Cup. He was outpaced going to the fourth last, but he'd been outpaced in an ultimate. There was no surprise in that. And he did start to make his challenge when he got down to the back of the third last fence. He's coming with his run going to the second last. You're thinking, wow, Corey Grammer is going to get involved. But that's about as close as he gets. And when he jumped the last fence, as Gallop and the Champ and Jerry Colon pulled away from him, I think he got quite empty in the last 100 yards and started up and down into one spot. That would be my one concern for Corey Grambler. Will that go cup run leave a lasting mark? I take that point. I thought that he was his at his absolute limit of speed of jumping throughout most of that race and that hence he was dropped out. Jane, what's your view? I'm trusting in Lucinda Russell and Peter Scudamore. They have reported post-race that he's bouncing. Uh, I met them before the race. They were using that as this target. The Gold Cup unusually was being used as the springboard to the Grand National. So I think he's favourably treated in the race and I think he's a serious chance. What Ruby is saying, nobody will know until after the Grand National. You can't take the literal margin between him and Vanillier either, can we? Because he hit the front far too soon. In last year's race, he absolutely hosed up. And he's an idle horse when he hits the front. Just look at his ultimate form from last year. Mm. Look, I'm not saying you can take that literally either with fast or slow, but his form is stacking up very well. And he lit up in the entry last year. I, I think he's a 10-year-old, but I, 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 I think he saves himself for the spring. And I think he's coming good now. Also, I think he's quite a clever jumper. Um, I don't think he's a particularly brave jumper. It reminds me of something that Brian Fletcher used to say about Red Rum, that Red Rum wasn't particularly brave at his fences, but he was clever and he was careful in a, in a good sense. And I think Corrick Rambler is a lot like that. And he's bidding to become the first horse since Tiger Roll in 2019, of course, to win back-to-back -back national. He was the first one since Red Rum. Your case next. For or against, I am Maximus against and he's a clever horse uh, like Carrick Rambler but thinks a lot. This is the first two fences of the Irish Grand National last year. Paul Townen lines up down the inside and he loses ground at each fence. At fence six he actually has to give him a reminder because he's not travelling whatsoever in what is a big field. Paul Townen then has to decide what am I going to do? Am I going to stay in here absolutely going nowhere or am I going to switch out around 25 odd runners? So he does as they pass the stands with a fence to go he says this is enough enough he switches out and this completely transforms the horse's chances. And this is probably what's going to have to happen in the Aintree National as well. Switches out, this horse jumps to his left, which isn't ideal to have to switch out on a right-handed track in a field this size, again, out to his left. But he starts to come on the bridle because as we found out laterally, this is a grade one staying horse. He gets up, he's got a good tenacious attitude when he is asked for effort, but he's clever, he thinks a lot. And it took a masterful ride for him to win the Irish National last year. But can that be repeated in a race as big and as competitive as this? Contrast that run with the same track, small field, loads of light, out to the left, out to the left, very careful. He loses at 14 of the 18 fences in the Bobby Joe. Look at that. 14 of the 18, he loses ground. Can you do that against Vanillier, who's gaining? 
Uh, Paul, uh, Jody McGarvey was riding him here. He's out, this is approaching the last again. Bunny hops. He's a horse that has the ability to win this race. I have absolutely no doubt. Martin Brazel went on the record during the week saying all he has to do is get around. But he could be out of contention by the time they get to the Beecher number six or number five in the course if he jumps up in the air like this. You know you haven't jumped well if Vanillier is out jumping you because he loves feathering the brakes going into fences. Look at that last fence graphic. <laughs> right, Ruby, <laughs> what, what do you make of, of I Am Maximus? Because he earned some warm words from Willie Mullins after that Bobby Joe success. He was talking about him in terms of being a grade one chaser. And I know he does burrow down his fences to the left, but I I'm just really nervous about dismissing a horse of that ability. Uh, I'd be the same. Um, you would love to see him jump a lot faster, but he's going to jump the way he jumps. He's very, very safe. He just takes a long time, but really slow ground is probably going to help him because they won't be going as quick, so he won't be losing as much speed as, as he could on quicker ground. But look, I couldn't see Paul going down the inside on him. I'd say even though he goes left, he has to have the room. Mm. I mean, he had no room in Fairy House. He was just very careful. I think he'd be middle to outside and allowing him to jump into his left. But look, would I back him? Absolutely not. Will I be shocked if he wins? No, I won't. Yeah, so you both uh, agree about where Paul Townend will be riding. I am Maximus. Um, yeah, I, he can go straight, you know. He can, oh, he can do what he wants. Exactly. Yeah, but he's clever. Yeah, you know what I mean? Too there's, clever. There's a little, there's clever is probably a kind way of putting it, but he's claustrophobic. Yeah, yeah. So he'll be interesting to watch. I wouldn't, I wouldn't call him clever because he was clever. He just goes straight because he's the shortest way. And <laughs> he's, a, he's a monkey. That's what he is. <laughs> Exactly. Right. Let's have uh, a view from David McIntyre, shall we? His shout is for Panda Boy. And this is why. Better off with a couple of the better fancied runners at the weights. Looks like an extreme trip will eke out more improvement. Trainer has laid out one before that I bet ah. are. <laughs> ah, that is a perception bias, maybe. Uh, a results bias. I can't see him at the first four, he says. Ruby, you've picked up Panda Boy. Do you agree with David or not? I think he's a great chance and I would definitely say that the amount of weight he has to carry would be a big help. This is him in the 2022 Paddy Power Irish Gold Cup. Ain't that a shame in front of him, real steel, Foxy Jackson, the white colours, uh, the old car comes in the Jigginstown colours, a cracking run from him, Panda Boy, um, but he just doesn't quite or wasn't quite well enough in on the day to win and ultimately finish his third. He then went to the Irish Grand National where he arrived with his chance, go to the second last behind I am Maximus and he caught your eye. This is this year's Paddy Power Gold Cup. Meeting of the waters running away from him. He was up four pounds to a mark of 140. He's up a bit more in the English national, but he does stay, he keeps going. And the main attraction for me for him is the weight he's carrying under so far under 11 stone. This was last year's Irish Grand National. He kept plugging away, he should stay, but um, I don't think he's got that much up his sleeve. It's just the fact that he's carrying a lovely weight. Yeah, like I am Maximus, he is an eight-year-old. He was doing this kind of thing as a seven-year-old, which is very promising. I like this horse. Jane, what do you think? I like Panda Boy. Uh, I've, um, I, I think with the ground going to be kind of an extreme territory, I can see him running in the top five. Do I see him winning the race? Probably not, but he'll stay. OK, and do you uh, envisage, Ruby, that he'll be re re retaining the cheek pieces? I would hope so. They definitely didn't do him any harm anyway. Um, Rather than swapping for off. something else? Maybe. I'm trying to think Martin Brazel blinkers. Can't think of too many. Not sure he's a man for blinkers. OK, uh, let's move on to Meeting of the Waters. And this is the choice for Jane. Yes, uh, of course, he's a talking horse. He's been backed all week. Uh, this is the Paddy Power when he's carrying Paul Burns blue colours. This is just to demonstrate how keen he was. First two fences, he actually laid down over the first and Danny Mullins takes him back to get him a little bit of cover after we approach fence two. Obviously, the Paddy Power, one of the most competitive handicap chases run in Ireland and he was keep competing off a mark of 130, subsequently got £17 for winning. We skip ahead then to the Ultima where he's in J.P. McManus's hoops. This is the first fence. Again, Mark Walsh needs to, he, he, he's jumped him off to get him cover, to get him to relax, and he has been fighting him. He's not a simple ride. This is fence two and up past the stands, and this is just, again, demonstrated this horse is going to have to settle better if he's going to get the trip in the national. Fence 14, uh, that's fine. He's after switching off here. He's jumped well. He's making ground. Fence 15, he jumps into the back of horses there. That kind of checks his momentum. 
Um, we're going down the hill the sideline angle is just to show where he is in comparison to the eventual winner Chianti Classico. He jumps three out good and clean. Now I thought this was going to put him right into contention with a major chance. But as he jumps two out, Lydia, I think he gets empty. Mm. And while Mark you know, he's going through all of the motions. He's not exactly, for me, running on like a horse that'd say, oh, you'll win the entry national. So for a horse that's being backed all week and Mark Walsh has not been loyal to him, he's going with the mare, I think he's plenty short enough. Yeah. Uh, I think maybe, because he's a seven-year-old, he's a novice, there's a lot of factors that tick all the trend boxes, but I'm just not convinced. Yeah, and Labour Gates, of course, went as a novice as a, as a seven-year-old. I take the keen point as well. That was, I was something I was worried about with eight and that a shame last season. He seems to be potentially in the same mould. What do you think, Ruby? Yeah, I, I thought going to the last year was going to run by Twig and get a bit closer to Clean to Classico. And ultimately, he didn't. When he got to Twig, halfway up the run and Twig went again. So stamina would be my slight concern for him, the way he races. OK, again, you're in agreement in what the question mark is. And it's good to raise these with Meeting of the Waters, particularly given he has been quite well backed in, in recent days. Mark Walsh, interestingly, has chosen Limerick Lace, though, instead. Yeah, and we'll get to her in a moment. But Danny Mullins, obviously, who won the Paddy Power on him, will know him better. I'd say he'll have to get cover and he'll have to smuggle him a bit. Mm -hmm. And in the modern day national, you can uh, drop in a bit and, and, and actually win the race, whereas before you had to be in the first quarter, didn't you? Yeah, absolutely. It has changed, as we have uh, documented on this series. Right. One of your views again. This is about Kitty's Light. Ooh, we've got a poet. There is a horse named Kitty's Light who's waited to put up a hell of a fight. Roared home by the scouse, there won't be a dry eye in the house when he finishes with all his might. We're going to have to have a word about scanning, I'm afraid, there. But I'm going to hand over to Ruby to make the case for or against Kitty's Light. I'm not going to question the poetry any of Lydia was far more uh, than I could have done. Made a mistake early in the Ultima and was off the bridle quite early and never looked like getting involved. But again, it's probably not Kitty, Kitty's light time of year. Now, Kitty's light has his own way of jumping. He's low and he's quick, which ultimately suits uh, an English Grand National in the modern era. Flicked that over the second last and obviously knew that there's very little fences in there because he doesn't get off the ground to the last and lands galloping. Um, that was a good performance. He backed that up with a win in the Bet365 Gold Cup. And again, low, quick, slick jumping. A lot of people question whether Tiger Rowan could win a Grand National the way he jumped. I don't think Kitty's like jumps unlike him, and I think he was valued for a bit further than he won the Bet365, but it was still a hell of a performance to back it up. The one concern for him is the ground, and our texter was right, or our social media person was right. There won't be a dry eye in the house if Kitty, like, Kitty's like wins the Grand National. He would be an incredible story, um, but he would need, I think, a lot of sunshine between now and Saturday, which he's not going to get. Jane, are you concerned about the ground for Kitty's Light? Um, I think Kitty's Light has defied everything I ever thought he would do. Uh, he's, he's Nathaniel out of Refuse to Bend, who didn't make around four or five grand at book three. He's, done, he's won two nationals. I'm not going to dismiss him because everything he's done defies logic. Mm. Cheek pieces back on, Ruby? Oh, I'd say they will be, yeah. But anything else that can go with them, no, Christian. <laughs> right, let's move on to Limerick Lace. We ment mentioned her in passing and now Jane is going to focus on her. Yes, she'd be the first mayor since Nickel Coyne in 1951 to win the race. She was back, well back here, five out. That's five out in the Troy Town uh, back in Navan in November. Uh, Aidan Kelly rode her this day. She went down the inside and she really warmed up into the race behind Coco Beach, who of course reopposes. She there laid down her gauntlet between the last two fences and she stays very, very well as we saw and we will see at the Cheltenham Festival. This is a the last fence. She does swish the tail, never mind that, she is resolute and uh, Aidan Kelly gets to the last fence and he just maintains the gap. Coco Beach maintains the winning margin but she doesn't for any, uh, um, in my interpretation, didn't weaken at all. That's the mayor's chase, the Paddy Powers mayor's, mayor's chase. She was very airy. She jumped him a little bit like they were on fire but she actually gains ground at a lot of her fences. I think she gained six lengths overall according to IQ data. But Keith Dunn, who down the inside, there's Marsha or um, Kieran Gethings said, no, 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 you can't go up my inside. Keith goes around and ultimately gets there plenty soon enough anyway as Dino Blue lays down his, uh, her challenge. But 
while people were concentrating on the favourite in second, this mare has hit the front effectively at the home bend, gets in tight to the last, but absolutely stays all the way to the line on ground that she relished. Again, never mind the flick of the tail, she stays very, very well. She's by Walking the Park, a full sister to I Know The Way You're Thinking Who won the Kim Muir and runs in the grade one staying chase on the Friday. But this mare is very, very good. I think she's on the improve as well, so I think she could still be ahead of her mark. And I'm not surprised Mark Walsh has chosen her because I think she's the one that actually has more margin than what she's running off. She's totally unexposed as a staying chaser, isn't she? Yeah. I, I didn't think last year she'd end up being this progressive, but she has, uh, and particularly with mares, you never know where they will end up. Her confidence is now at a sky high. I, I don't think she's claustrophobic. You can see in the Troy Town, she went down the rail. She's used to big fields and she was just very good at Cheltenham. She can make a blunder out of nowhere. She did that at Doncaster. I think I remember her doing it at Ferry House last season. Is that a concern? To be honest, it, she was good at Navin. She was good at Cheltenham. Any horse can make a blunder. I think she's learning. I think she's getting better. OK. Ruby, what's your view? She'll be looking that I way. think, looking at her, and even in that race and at the Tritone, I think if she's in front and she gets into a battle, she'll stay in front. But I think if she's behind and she gets into a battle, she won't go by. That's the kind of mare I see her as. It's a long run from the last fence. It's an interesting theory. I actually don't have a... I, I'm not going to debate that. I don't really have an opinion on that. But if she's going to get into a battle if she's running in the national. Yeah, I don't have an opinion on that. But it's an interesting thought, Ruby. I'm going to go back and have a look at her, her runs through that with that thought in mind. Obviously, she likes testing ground. Didn't Magic of Light hit the frame another mare quite recently? Second to Tiger Road. Yeah. Buddy. Kennedy, they banked the last two fences and it might have been different if they didn't, but I'd say not a lot and of mares. And, and the chair. And yeah, the she, chair. Hit, she hit virtually everything she as far as I can She hit a lot of fences and stood up. <laughs> not a lot of mares would have contested the National with a realistic chance mm -hmm. either. You know, mm -hmm. you had slow, Snow Leopard and you had a few, but this mare is coming in here with a proper chance. Okay. Ruby, you've put up Marla Mission now and I'm fascinated. Are you for or against? I'm slightly against um, for the reason that I think he just doesn't quite have enough runs. Again, he jumps to his left, not as bad as I am, Maximus, and he's a really good jumper, but he does jump out to his left. Thunder Rock, I think it was, came and beat him here at Carlisle in his first run. He progressed from there to the Coral Gold Cup at Newbury, where he ran an absolute blinder behind That's All Right, Gino. And his standout bit of form probably is, um, or not standout, but he's a really good run last year at Cheltenham in the National Hunt Chase as well, when Johnny Barry rode him. Now, he jumped into contention or jump to the front in last year's National Hunt Chase um, up here at the fourth last fence but it's from here to the third last fence Johnny let him run and he opened up a huge gap over Chemical Energy and Guy and the men nearly got down to the third last they were starting to close on when he got to the second last and to me he just it's a typical second last for the Cheltenham Johnny said go on man a mission got in and he crumpled over on landing and fell where he would have finished who would have known but I do think when you look back through all Grand National winners they've had at least three runs in a season this fella's only had two, and fitness could tell. And how about stamina? How about stamina, Jane? Uh, I don't think that'll be an issue. Um, and I do take Ruby's point about the three runs, but John McConnell has, you know, since last year, he's painted this path for him. So he obviously feels that is the right way to train the horse. So I don't really share those concerns. OK. Do you have any stamina concerns? I think it's, it's not proven yet, and I'm not no. completely convinced. No, but possibly. But my worry is he did improve from Carlisle to Newbury. And after having such a long layoff, if he's any way fresh, and, and it came home to me when I wrote Rat Finn that after having only one run in a year, he raced too fresh in the Grand National. And whilst he finished third, I think he could have achieved a hell of a lot more. It's like, to me, the Grand National is like running in a marathon. You have to have the miles in the tank. OK. Um, I wouldn't have run many marathons now, Ruby. Have you run many marathons? I don't partake in race, I can't win Jane, so I never <laughs> run a marathon. <laughs> and there we drop the mic. <laughs> he hasn't got a particular record fresh either. You're going to be against my next one as well, which is a bit of a flyer. Let's take a look at Chemical Energy, and I'm actually going to pick up the National Hunt chase where Ruby left off, where Marla Mission exited. And I just want to talk about this horse, who I think is, might be a little bit underestimated. This race really is the basis of his chance. He made his ground more easily than Gayard de Mainil, then that horse manages to surge past him. But he, in essence, is a better horse. He's finished third in an Irish national in his next start. He's finished third in a Grand National. Next time out, Chemical Energy wasn't 
in the same kind of form. He jumped really well under a more patient ride at Cheltenham. He was back to his blundering. We've only seen him once this season. This is in the Kerry National. There was a typical blunder from him. Um, it did favour speed, this race, on the day. Horses that were prominently positioned were favoured. It was difficult to make ground from the back. So he was in the right place. But I'm not sure he was in the right place for him. So I think in order to have a chance in the National, they're going to have to revert to some patient tactics. He was returning from a break here as well, so um, maybe he wasn't at sort of peak fitness. He is capable fresh. The question is about his jumping. How do you feel about chemical energy? I think he's very ground reliant mm -hmm. and I think he needs good ground. You think that the, the ground is going to be totally against oh, 100%. him? 100%. I've always felt that with him. Uh, his best form is on good, maybe good to soft. Yeah, OK. I mean, I, I take that point. It, it, is, it is going to need to dry out. They're saying it is going to potentially dry out, but maybe it won't. Ruby, do you feel the same? Is it ground that is the concern? Uh, I would say it's only one run this season. Lydia, for me, he hasn't run since the stall last year. And again, the miles aren't in the tank. OK, so we're going to move on to Minella Indo, Jane, the former Gold Cup winner. Yeah. Uh, the classiest horse in this field? At, By a mile. Yeah. I know he's 11. Yeah. I get it. I know the argument. But we'll try and make a different argument. This is Punchestown October. The Grade 3 where he absolutely jumped for fun. Uh, this is good co company, com uh, conflated and uh, dealt to work in behind him. I just thought he really enjoyed himself this day. His ears were pricked. The home bend, the last fence and he's idle and he hits the line well. You thought you were going to have a really fruitful year. Subsequently he ran it down royal and he ran no kind of race. But I argue maybe the yards horses weren't exactly firing at the time. But then they were going all guns blazing to Aintree, but they were going to go via the uh, cross-country race at Cheltenham. He ran here uh, in December. This is the canal turned the second time. Rachel gives him a sight at all of the fences, so she goes wide on this occasion. The next two jumps, I thought he was really fluent. He showed great appetite for an older horse, a horse that's danced a lot of dances. He's still got a very good hunger for the sport. Uh, the home bend here, he's wide and he does slip. Mm. That can knock a horse, uh, their momentum and their confidence and late night pass just in front of him as they're jumping the last. So that was his first run from Down Royal. That was going to be used as a prep run for March. By no means do I expect that to be the fully furnished Manila Indo that we're going to see on Saturday. He's the class horse. If he takes to the fences, I think that might actually relight the fire that, you know, we've seen a horse to win a Gold Cup, finish second a Gold Cup, win an Oliver Bartlett, place in an RSA chase. He's just a little bit forgotten from a trainer who, when he targets a race, rarely misses. Yeah, first two in the race that, of course, when uh, Minella Times won. Balco just... de Flo is always forgotten. He is, he is. Why? He's well. he a he's classy horse. Second. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it just shows that, you know, he, it, you're right about the sort of consideration of targets. And although I think inarguably Minella Rindo isn't the horse that he was, he's still capable of winning a grade three. He have to be. No, he doesn't. He was very good. What does Ruby think? Ruby? Uh, the grade three was the race in Punchestown where he beat Hurricane Georgie. Um, he looked round, but the two horses he beat that you're talking about, Conflated and Delta Walk, looked like small rhinoceroses on that occasion. Um, he, it could happen. I just don't know. Is the fight still there? Maybe it is. Right, let's move on to Glyn Watkins, who has a view about Delta Work. This is his, carrying £5 less than when third two years ago, £20 better off with Noble Yates, and seated when going OK last year. Better preparation this time around. We'll love the ground. Do you agree, Ruby? I think, yeah, look, he's 11. He's, yeah, he will like the ground. He stays really well. This is him finishing third to any second now, and Noble Yates back in 2022. Obviously, the handicapper has given him, well, Given him five pounds, um, some sort of a small little chance since then. He did beat Galvin in the cross country race at uh, the Chantler Festival in 2022, and they were a mile clear of the remainder. So, look, he does like the ground, he does stay. He knuckled over and slithered on landing at the 21st fence in last year's Grand National. But I think with the conditions the way they are, he's had the required amount of runs. Ideally, the run at the Cheltenham Festival would have been good for him, but here he is, just catches the top. Those who had to stand up and then slitters to eventually on seats. But um, yeah, I think he could run into the money at a big price each way. I am not keen. He's always been a scruffy jumper. He's been mildly unfortunate both times in the National. He does tend to go left. I think he lacks agility for the race. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. He's a very good cross-country horse. I thought when he first ran in the race that he was banker material and he disappointed me and I've kind of held it against him ever since. Um, <laughs> I, Not a forgiving story. Banker oh, in the national. <laughs> I think there's a, there is a stat out there whereby 
13 of the last 15 winners of the race were having their first run in the race. Mm -hmm. And I think he's had his chance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, third time lucky. Not for me, I don't think. Amberley House was third time lucky. He, she, he was. He absolutely was. But uh, this, is, this is tougher, I think. This is tougher. It's the national. Anything can happen. But it wouldn't be for me. Capadano, is he for you? I'm against him. Go Keith on. who likely to ride him. This is the uh, national last year where he pulled up, but Danny Mullins was riding him. He just jumped into the air at the fences three and four. He was very deliberate. And we'll skip ahead to show the, uh, this is the Beecher, Beecher's Brook. Yeah, and then we're going to go on to the Foyne Avon, uh, where he just isn't that fluent for me. We'll skip ahead to the Valentine's second time. You see Danny switched well out on him now, loads of light. And again, just skews in the air. He reaches for this next fence and Danny hails a cab. And it just isn't all that rhythm rhythmic for me. Again, Danny's good and wide on him. He obviously feels he needs to be out there. I don't think you win a national from out there. Uh, he switches in to jump the third last, where I thought he was going to run on into some kind of a race uh, place, and he pulls up. We skip ahead to the Ryanair chase again. He jumps it like it's on fire. Uh, skip to fences six and seven. His upside's conflated, obviously. We know, now know conflated runs on the Friday. He gets into a rhythm. He's right behind on violin. The horse eventually finishes second. I thought that this was the perfect position for him to be in, but he lacks tactical pace over that shorter trip. This was probably to get him a bit of a sharpener for entry. But again, his jumping is just adequate. Mm -hmm. Adequate for me, not really good enough for what the expectations are. And Willie Mullins seems to be very sweet on him and has mentioned him in all of the previews for this race. But again, he hits the line. But he doesn't really pass up the hill uh, conflated for me for a horse who I deem to be the strongest of stairs. So I, I just... Over the fences, he's not a natural. He's had his chance and he didn't even finish. Yeah, fairly adequate jumper, I would have him. I think he's, he's scrappy, full stop. I also wonder about stamina weight. last time. Yeah, stamina over the, the Ryanair test was inadequate. I thought. I meant the Grand National, strong. sorry, the last year's National. Yeah, yeah. He's by Manduro, so yeah. He ha did only have a one run uh, last season. At least he's had a fuller season. Maybe that had some kind of impact. Last year, Ruby can correct me if I'm wrong, he had the Gold Cup entry. This year, he had no Gold Cup entry. He was always, I think, coming here. But would you agree his jumping is going to have to improve from last year? No, I think the race IQ shows you that. Danny was calling Kaz, but he's low and slick through the top of the fence. If this is not the race red run one, you need to be low and fast now to win a Grand National land. Last year, he only had one run, raced a bit keenly and paid the price because he didn't have the mileage in the tank. It was always going to happen, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Enough said. Uh, Gallia de Lito, Ruby. Yeah, look, I think she's a cracking mare. And I think weight, Lydia, is the reason that I would be going for Gallia Lito. I thought she ran a cracker here at Warwick behind my silver lining in the in the Warwick Classic Chase. But she had 11 stone, 12 in the back. I wasn't certain about her stamina heading here, whether she would keep up to it. I think she's a good jumper. But I think with 10-6 on her back, she's trying to follow my silver lining, who she was given a hell of a lot of weight to, and who dragged her all the way. And she never gives up. She's going to get well beaten at the second last. Again at the last, she's a couple of lengths down, and she keeps staying all the way to the line. And I think with 10 stone, 6 on her back, I think it is. I think that 10 stone, 7 now, now we can flat it out. I think that's going to suit her. I think she'll keep galloping. She's a good jumper. And I think at a price, she's an each way pole. Well, the good news is, Ruby, that Dave Deer agrees with you. And here is the proof. Is there a better target trainer, he asked rhetorically, than Dan Skelton? The evidence of Chutland 2024 suggests not. She's got stamina, a low weight, back class, and the beating of Mr Incredible on recent form all in her favour. And her odds are tasty. Your view on Gallia de Lito, Jane? I don't disagree with that. Um, they've been working back from this all year. I, major chance. Another mare. Another mm. mare with a major mm. chance. Absolutely. Totally unexposed as a marathon chaser. Now we're going to take a break from looking at the individual road. Runners, and we've got a very different kind of analyse this from Ruby. So analyse this is slightly different this week and we're going to look at the possible changes one could make to the conditions of the Entry Grand National for the 2025 edition to make it the most competitive race that it quite possibly could be. So for me, a horse should have to run a minimum of three times in the current season and a run is only deemed a run when you've completed 75% of the race. A horse must finish in the first four in a chase or cross-country race between the 1st of March 2024 and the Midlands Grand National in 2025. Obviously, from entry next Saturday, the first six should count, 
So add two places on for that one. And a provision then needs to be added for races with five runners or less. I have nothing against Fury Road, but finishing last of four in the Bobby Joe beating the country mile shouldn't really count. Then winning penalties could also be applied. So from the 1st of March 2025 until the Midlands Grand National, if a horse wins, it could get a £5 penalty to jump itself up the ballot. Now, if you apply that to the 2024 Grand National, these are the horses that will come out. Janadil will come out because he hasn't had a run over the distance of offences in, in 23 months. Farouk Delen and run Royal Fred because they don't meet the form. Mac Totty again will drop out because he hasn't got the, the distance of offences. And on the ropes, a purely drop out because of form. Mal Mission, Mr. Incredible and Chemical Energy would all drop out because they haven't run three times in the current season. A bit harsh on those three because they would add to the race, but the conditions would be different for next year and people would know that. What would get in then this year would be Eclat de Rear, Shambard, Kitty's Light, Melina Girl, Desamore House, Kinod of Katbu, Shikamo Parry, Fakir Delane, and that would leave Annual Invictus as the first reserve. Now, with people knowing the conditions, things would change. But it would still mean Janadil, Farouk Delane, Run Royal Fred, Mac Tottian on the ropes as form horses would drop out. And the inclusions would be Eclat de Rear, Shambard, Kitty's Light, Melina Girl, and Desamore House. To me, that makes the race more competitive. It's only my thoughts. But they're the sort of discussions I think that need to take place. Uh, my thanks to Ruby for those thoughts there and also for his contribution to this show. He's had to run to get a flight, but he has left behind his first fall, which we will talk about later on in the show. But Jane, your reaction to Ruby's ideas? Yeah, not the first time I've heard him um, suggest these. Uh, I, I don't know if, if there, there is a contingency about having to finish in the first couple of placings over an extended distance. Um, but if he were to say Janadil, okay, he was an uncompetitive second to Alaho in a graded event at Clonmel. He was an uncompetitive third in a grade two. But still, should that not qualify him? Or if, for instance, you have a Noble Yates in the intervening year gets injured, should he not be allowed to run if he hasn't met the criteria? So I think it sounds good out in, in, in paper, but I don't know if the logic when it comes down to actual incident, individual cases, is that where your committee, your entry committee comes in, where they can use their discretion? I don't know. You have to draw the line somewhere. I think it would be a, a quite... You think it has to be black and white? I think so. I think it'd be quite a difficult call to ask the panel to make a judgment on form about whether a, whether a horse has achieved enough to be there. I mean, I, I personally cannot find an argument to fancy Janadil, so I can understand. Yes. But you have, there are cases where a horse hasn't, uh, say, maybe proven its ability to stay. Balco de flow. Over an extended distance, and then they win the national. Like, I'm not saying um, Tiger Roll is a great example, but, you know, he, he, a lot of people thought he wouldn't, he wouldn't win a national, that he wouldn't jump around, and his jumping record wasn't good enough, and here we are. He was one of the most legendary horses of the race, so... Be very careful about it. Um, I, I, I like the idea of gaining a penalty to get up the ballot mm -hmm, if mm -hmm. you are after a, recent, uh, a significant recent win. That's something that I would consider very strongly because that gives you a chance to fight your corner rather than accepting, I'm rated 134, I'm not going to get in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I also can see a positive to the minimum three runs. I can see the negative that you've just outlined. But it's also the, the campaigning of horses where we essentially don't see them or we don't see them in, in circumstances in which they can be competitive, essentially until the weights come out. That can't be good for the whole season long. No, and look, sure, we see it with a Gold Cup example, album photo. You know, that's not really, I don't think it's good for anybody. Um, but look, it's, it's something that could force their hand. You take the, Jan, uh, the John McConnell example with Mahler Mission. He, he has laid out this path because he believes that's the right thing to do for his horse. So... Do you tell trainers how to train their horses? It won't suit every horse. Not every horse can take three runs over an extended distance on what will be heavy ground if it's in the middle of winter. That doesn't, that doesn't rock the boat of every horse. No, agreed. But again, the line has to be drawn somewhere. And if you know the r rules in advance, then you have to play to those rules, don't you? You do. Uh, it's a changing race. Uh, it's, I'd say they'll definitely consider it. Um, there's definitely going to be horses line up at the standing start and people will say that a horse shouldn't be there. But mm -hmm. that happens every year. 
I'd be interested in your thoughts, Rhoda. So if you have any uh, feedback on the case that uh, Ruby has made and also the points that Jane has made, I'd be really interested to hear them. Jane and I are going to continue with our look at the contenders in this year's National. We're going to start with an opinion from Alfie Potter about late night pass. Grand National stage on soft, heavy ground. A lightweight is usually imperative. He gets in light. 11-year-olds have a great record. And his former entry reads second, first, fourth. He's never fallen and had won over a marathon trip too. Every box is ticked for him. So let's take a look at him. This is his fourth, his least good achievement in the Fox Hunters chase, where he leads at the last, makes a mistake, and in the end he's swallowed up. The year before he won the race, fighting off a challenger at the elbow, and the year before that he was a really good second as well. He did go out to his right at the canal turn, and he can jump right, and I wonder whether that might be more exposed at this level. Now, he has been campaigned with the Grand National in mind this season. He's got better over two starts in cross-country events at Cheltenham. This is the one he won in December when he goes right away from the rest of the field. And of course, he switched trainers from Tom Ellis to Dan Skelton. They're from the same extended family, and Tom Ellis is now back in charge, having got his full licence. And this is the prep given to Late Night Pass. And I think you'd be fairly encouraged if you were confident he was going to stay because he was still in contention turning for home, but then he's well beaten. Now, admittedly, it's very testing ground. But for me, the one place, Jane, where I disagree with Alfie is about the stamina. That's the question mark for me. Yeah, passing glance. I don't really have an opinion on, on him in that regard. Um, not every horse flourishes the same over hurdles as they do over fences mm -hmm. as well. I remember my parents prepping Monty for his second national, uh, running him over hurdles, and he, he actually fell. Uh, because he had no respect for them. Um, so I wouldn't even look at that last run. On his cross country, he looks like he'll stay. Uh, it'd be one of the stories of the race. It'd be great. Um, the last, now I'm after pumping up Manila Indo to have a chance, so, and another 11-year-old, the last 11-year-old to win is? Go on, Tommy. Pino de Rey, who oh. completed the hat-trick of Neptune Collange. Um, Neptune Collange, I have it here, Aurora's Encore and, and Pino de Rey in 2014. So it can be done. And I don't think there's a better jumper in the race. He's, he's very solid. OK. You're not worried about that right, that going right thing? Um, I, I'm not really, to be honest. I think in the race, he, ha he has a bit of character, a little bit better than my Maximus, but I think it'll be fine. OK. Let us move on now to Coco Beach, I think, is the next one. And Jane, you're going to take over on him. Do you like him or do you not? I just think he's a horse that could run a big race at a big, big price. I don't, I don't know why anybody tries to make the running in the Ancient Grand National. They did that last year. This is the Beecher chase in December when Danny Gilligan rode him. He tried to be prominent. He accepted that he wasn't going to be good enough to be prominent, so he dropped him in. And he rode a very patient race. He ultimately rode to be placed uh, behind Shambard, who eventually won and does reoppose. If the ground is likely to be testing as it is, he will stay. Uh, he's a bit of a slogger, as we saw in the Troy Town. And I think, uh, you know, this has been the plan. He hasn't been over race this year. We skip ahead to the cross country race at Punchestown, where Jack Kennedy's first ride in a cross country race. What a horse to ride. That was him seven out, where he jumps to the front. Two out, he uh, just. He's in absolute comfort, comfort motion, and this is ideal prep for him. Uh, he was obviously supposed to run in the cross country at Cheltenham, didn't work out. But if we're going to have extreme conditions, if there's going to be a horse plugging on from the back, and if somebody's having, you know, bookmakers have paid top six or top seven, this horse is going to be big, big price. And I just think he will stay and he will jump well. It's interesting because uh, last twice, he hasn't looked like he's got home, but he's been too free, hasn't he? He was, I think he was buzzed up by what was going on last time and he was kind of pushed to go a little bit faster as well. The last two times he hasn't quite got home. He's a better horse this season, and as you say, they're riding him more circumspectly than previously. Yeah, I don't think in the national you can jump off and expect to try and win if you're going to make the running. Mm. And they did that last year, having jumped out wide, come across, that's giving away plenty of ground as well. And uh, I just... I think if they ride him to place, he'll place. If you ride him forward, forward, press, 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 he won't get home. But not many horses do in a national when you do that. Yeah, like you, I think he's... He, he lacks tactical pace. There's no, there's no doubt about that. He's not a classy horse. But this race, if it does turn into a slog, he's a slogger. Yeah, like you, I think he could hit the extended placings. Lacking tactical speed is a nice segue to the final horse we're going to look at in detail, and that is Mr. Incredible. That's certainly my view of him. But let's have a look at Randy Rand's view, first of all. 
He likes him for the race. Uh, perfect prep from a trainer who can buck all trends. Wasn't totally cooked in last year's race when and shipping Brian Hayes in the flat after travelling rail. Ran a monster race off 12 stone in the Midlands National after a year off. Same mark here. He represents Willie Mullins now. Now, he used to be in his younger days with Henry de Bromhead. Um, he refused to race in the 2021 Neville Hotels and he was reluctant at Tremor next time. Then he switched to... Willie Mullins, and this is the early stages of the Kim Muir, and he just needs to be pushed off into stride. And this was how he was being ridden at the time, with exaggerated waiting tactics. Things have changed. I know that Patrick Mullins has done a lot of work with this horse, trying to ensure that he is more straightforward, because apparently he, when he joined the yard, according to his owner, the horse just really wouldn't go. So gradually he's been brought into form. He gradually gets into this race as well from a long way back behind Angel's Dawn. This is him. And had he not done that at the final fence, he might have got a lot closer in the Kim Muir as well. Now he does hang out to the right having made his effort, but then he does stick on again. As I said, these days, he does seem to be more straightforward. He does seem to be handling the start. He was uh, sweetness and light at the start of the Grand National this time last year. And remember the circumstances around this. They had two, three, four attempts at getting this line up right. And you can see him there, and he jumps off perfectly well. And apparently Patrick Mullins has been doing some work on a standing start with him as well. Now, he was still going perfectly well, but he sort of lands in a bit of a heap at that point in Beaches, that second time round. He makes a small mistake at Foynaven, and then he makes his biggest error at the canal turn. And... Whether that causes or it is coincidental, the saddle then slips and unfortunately, Brian Hayes is unshipped. Now, he did seem to be going well enough. Yeah. I'm not entirely convinced about his jumping and I also think, critically, he lacks tactical speed and I think we saw that last time in the Midlands National. Yeah, look, first things first, I think he's an in-running in horse. Um, we've only seen him once this year. Look, start is very important for him. And I think that's ultimately where the jockey's going to find himself after four or five fences is ultimately how quick he, he gets off from the standing start. I take the note about the jumping, but he'll never fall. Mm -hmm. I feel like Agree. Yeah. brain haze, put down those irons or whatever you need to do, hold on to that next strap. This horse is so clever and so self-conserving, he uh -huh. won't fall. Uh -huh. um, what happened last year was just unfortunate, but he was travelling well. I wa he was catching my eye. Uh, lacking tactical pace maybe the ground being soft will take that element out of it mm -hmm. uh, I could see him running a big race um, again don't mind the le leaning out or left or right he'll decide what way he's going to lean on the day I think. <laughs> He, he adds some. He, he adds some interest. He's another There's one of the a couple characters. Of spicy horses. Yeah, the there always are. I think they add to it. Myself, mind you, I'm, I'm, I'm contradicting myself, bearing in mind that I said at the start of the show that the Grand National Panel should be removing horses who've given <laughs> <laughs> trouble at the start. Maybe this year's national will just go to show that you can put in all these stipendaries thing, all these <laughs> contingencies, because there's just no law. <laughs> possibly, possibly. Uh, it just proves to me that I'm sort of schizophrenic in terms of uh, when it We'd comes to. We'd run well in the national, wouldn't we? <laughs> I'm going to ask you for your one, two, three, four. Yes, you can. Hit me with um, so I think Cork Rambler has a great chance of going back to back. Uh, so do I. Very favourable. Oh my God, we agree on something. <laughs> That's not like the date and time. I have to come to the UK for somebody to agree with me. Um, <laughs> so I think he's favourable to treat you. You obviously agree. Limerick Lace, I think, 73 years since the mayor won the national, I think she's going to go very close. Uh, Mark Walsh obviously thinks so too. 1951, Nickel Coin, could we get another one on the board? I think Manila Indo is a class horse, and I'm not forgetting him. I think he doesn't have to be as good as he was to go very close in this national. And Rachel Blackmore, an obvious asset uh, for Henry de Bromhead. And I think Noble Yates, he's now the top weight, which isn't ideal having uh, seen Conflated come out. But He's just so reliable and solid. And the way he's been, he's been in great form all year. He's not an older horse. He's still only nine. Uh, I think he's very solid. I have to go to Ireland for someone to agree with me. <laughs> um. <laughs> Talk to me about Panda Boy. <laughs> I really like Panda Boy. I think that he's unexposed as a, as a marathon uh, as chaser. I like his weight, a bit like Ruby was saying earlier. And I can see him staying on really strongly. I, I really do like Limerick Lace. I think she's coming here at a sort of optimum form. 
I do just wonder about Coco Beach being able to repel her. I, I, that was one of her best performances. That does just, I do just wonder whether of the two, Panda Boy might be the stronger extreme distance stayer. And obviously you'll be against chemical energy. You've already mentioned the, the ground point, but I just think there is a case to be made for him. I, I do take the point about the ground, but let's see what it is. And Ruby, of course, he's gone for Cappadano. Gosh, he really, I mean, this, is, this is a perfect opportunity. Yeah. To completely- He's gone. <laughs> yeah, he's gone. <laughs> Let's so just slash these. You Come on. need a horse that will take the birch with it. So you need a horse that will take the evergreens home in the modern day national. Look, I just, like, he obviously made his own point. I won't contradict the man has won two nationals. Um, but it just wouldn't be for me. You made the point about Panda Boy. Del to work has been there with two efforts and he's going back to make a third time looking like Amberley House and Gallia de la Toe. We mentioned in our VTs as well why we like her and why the skeletons, if they win this race, they won't be just celebrating winning a national. Two out of four ain't bad for Ruby, really. Believe me, I've, I've sat next to him for <laughs> many seasons and two out of four is quite a good return, I think. Um, well, I sat next to him a lot in Ireland too, so yeah, we, we, we won't shoot him while he's not here to defend himself. <laughs> That's no fun. <laughs> Now, you know I'm going to pay for that later, don't you? I played a conservative card because I know you're going to pay for that. <laughs> I've been on that end. You're so much wiser than I am. Um, outside of the National, is there anything you're particularly looking forward to? I have to say, Aintree's grade ones look particularly compelling this time around. Those first four races on Thursday are as good as Cheltenham on Tuesday. Dare I say it? Yeah, I think mm. they're fantastic races. I, I'd be fascinated to see how Jerry Colomb comes out of Cheltenham after that massive mammoth run in the Gold Cup. And Corbett's cross, the novice thrown mm. in. Emmett Mullins doing what he does best, mm. throwing us a curveball and fascinated to see it. Um, I think on Perry pass, skipping Cheltenham, along with Bob Ollinger, that makes for a very good entry hurdle. Uh, Protectorat, I think that Melling Chase is made for him. Um, Chupo, can he confirm the form? I don't see why he can't, especially with the ground being the way it is. There are just a few names that I'm looking forward to. What about yourself? I'm particularly looking forward to Ginny's Destiny and Grey Dawning, the rematch. Be very tactical, won't it? I think so. I mean, I think that it could advantage Ginny's Destiny. My feeling watching the Turners was if that ground had been quicker, that Ginny's Destiny would probably have won that, which is not to detract from Grey Dawning, because I think he has got... Uh, and, and I know this might be anathema for many people in Ireland, but I think he's got at least as good a chance in next year's Gold Cup as this fact to file. OK, that's interesting. We'll find out this week. Yeah, we will. We'll, sort of, we'll, we'll, we'll find out a little bit more. I think he's got yeah. that kind of stamina. I think he's a very, very good horse. There's no doubt he's a very good horse, but the Trainers' Championship will be also the theme running through it. It will. I'll be watching from home. Don't make any mistakes. <laughs> 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 OK. <laughs> I'll try not to. I will make mistakes. <laughs> Uh, right, if you need more, you can find everything that you need at racingtv.com forward slash grand hyphen national. Do not forget that hyphen. <laughs> As ever, you can also rewatch this show via Racing TV's YouTube channel from 7 a.m. tomorrow. You can also find, by the way, on the, on the YouTube channel, a really interesting feature that Alex Stephen did with Ted and Ruby Walsh about Papillon. So check that out too. Many thanks to Jane for her excellent contributions to this show. Thank you. Thanks and for having me. It's a pleasure. Any time. Come back any time. Also to Ruby for his. He and I will be back for Road to Punchestown later this month. In the meantime, enjoy entry. Paddy Power. Sponsors of the Road to Cheltenham.